my colleague ministers, distinguished guests, let me first uh, thank the Vietnamese government for its hospitality. And let me also congratulate India Foundation for the third uh, meeting of this Indian Ocean Conference. I was just listening to the various speakers yesterday and said that if the world stopped dreaming, there'd be no great future for this planet. So when thinkers, political thinkers, governments come with huge ideas that might look impossible to implement, then we have to think of one thing, that in 1957, the now EU was then the common market. The Treaty of Rome was signed in 57. No one thought that 50 years later, this common market will become this huge EU that is today on the verge of political integration. Dreams come true when it achieves a critical mass. And I think that the dream of Prime Minister Modi, the Sagar dream, for the future of the region, whether it be the Road and Belt Initiative of Prime Minister of President Zhu in China. Our first reaction is to say, how can this be? Because it looks like a titanic project. And yet, I am sharing with you one thing today, and this is the experience, the small experience I have derived and which I'll share with you today when it comes to regional integration, when it comes to ocean uh, architecture, when it comes to living together and learning to live together. I believe that the post-colonial period of one market, one planet is over. That's my feeling. So what was termed globalization, the concept of one market, one planet, the concept of a one size fit all approach of the World Trade Organization is over. It's over because it is no longer reflecting what the future of this planet is. Geopolitics is moving from one center to multi centers, which we can't ignore. So this is probably where we have to to acknowledge that the globalization approach, the global village approach hasn't worked. And the World Trade Organization today in Geneva is looking for a way of reinventing itself. But what is now becoming a very quick reality is the very strong commitment of countries to unite within one region. Who would have thought that Africa 55 nations would meet and would dream of one African continental free trade area. No one. And I had the pleasure of signing recently in Rwanda that Mauritius will join the Africa free trade continental area. We did it. And we are also signing very soon the trilateral trade agreement that comprises Comesa, SADC, and the EAC in Africa. This is a clear indication that the world is regionalizing itself. So within this global approach, I find the initiative of India to be something that we have to deal with, respect, and see how we can work it through. And we can't ignore also that there are various initiatives. One is from China, the Obo initiative. Japan also is uh, on a major initiative. All of them rotate under, I think, one beautiful concept. And I think Srimati uh, uh, Swaraj yesterday said it very well. We want interdependence and not dominance. First aspect, which I think is important. We who have lived the colonial period of the mighty and the weak, speaking of interdependence makes sense. Speaking of win-win situation where all players are winners is something which is new, which we have to respect also. And the fact that we are all thriving for peace 
for stability, for security, for prosperity makes sense also. So this is why Mauritius is fully behind those initiatives. Because as a small island, we are compelled to open ourselves to the world. So probably today, I would rather not speak of what has been said, but share with you of things we can't ignore. It would not be in the interest of those huge projects that we don't try to hide under the carpet certain realities. And I would like to share this with you. One, sovereignty and territorial integrity. We should not forget that most of us come from the colonial period, that this proud nation, which is Vietnam, which through an incredible sense of courage, of commitment, managed to get oppressors out, that we all come from colonies and we need to be respected and we need one thing, that our territory, our sovereignty is fully recognized and respected. In fact, any regional project that doesn't go in the sense of respect of national sovereignty and integrity will not go through. This is my feeling. One, we have to consider it, pay great attention to it, and not ignore it. One, two, you know this one-size-fit-all approach cannot work. The World Trade Organization managed through a few decades to dictate that we all have to follow one road. And we realize today that the one-size-fits-all approach will not work for two reasons. One, in the group that we are speaking of, whether it be Obor or whether it be Sagar, we are speaking of GDP per capita ranging from 400 US dollars to 40,000 US dollars. The divide is huge, and we have to bear this in mind, that when we want to work together, we have to also take into consideration the fact that we, don't, we are all not at a level playing field in terms of revenue. And third, and not least also, when it comes to one size fit all, is that we are dealing with countries which are different. Small Mauritius, we are less than 2,000 square kilometers. And we are speaking of an organization where there will be huge countries behind it. China, India. So there also, I think that when we speak of working together, we have to acknowledge that the size of the countries and the weight of the countries are to be considered when we work out schemes to work together. So those are probably a few points I've taken up just to say that we should not try to hide below the carpet issues which we will have to deal with if we want the organization to succeed. Now, therefore, we have moved away from what I would call continental FTAs, like the EU, like the Africa CFTA. We are now developing the concept of ocean FTAs. I find this beautiful, that we are connected not by territories, but we are connected through the ocean. So this is what we are proposing today, is to say that all those who are connected through the oceans can work together in the interest of all and prosper. And I would like here to share with you what we are doing in Mauritius, which might maybe be of interest, I am presently chair of the Indian Ocean Commission that groups five countries in the region, namely Madagascar, Seychelles, Como, Réunion, and Mauritius. I am also chairman of the contact group that was set up by the Security Council uh, to fight uh, piracy in Somalia. So I've been dealing a lot with the region. And small Mauritius, we have a problem. We are a middle-income group country stuck in the middle-income trap. And we are trying to move out of it. How? Through development of three new pillars, which I think 
coincide with what we want to do today. The three new pillar pillars of the Mauritian economy for the 50 next years probably would be one, the ocean economy, which we are speaking of, two, the maritime hub development on the same basis as Dubai and Singapore, and number three, the Africa story. We are African, Mauritius is part of the 55 states forming part of Africa. We've signed all the agreements you can dream of with Africa. So the three components have helped us to look deeper into one, trade, and number two, marine security. Number one, trade. Mauritius can't survive without trade. No man is an island, no island is an, is a, is an ocean, so we have learned to open totally to the external world. And we are doing it through two ways. One is through the signing of bilateral FTAs, and two, through working with governments on a G2G level. We are not fighting uh, regional FTAs, they are there. We are committed to the Africa FTAs, we are committed also to the Sagar uh, initiative, we are committed to the Obor initiative, but still we think that waiting for the whole thing to develop might take time. So what we are doing now is number one, working out FTAs. So we've signed the Africa continental FTA plus the trilateral FTA, and we've moved on the left to opening the door with countries that can contribute to the development of Africa. So we have presently negotiating with India, SECPA, which is a huge FTA, bilateral India Mauritius. We have finalized uh, since a few days also uh, an FTA with China, which would be the first free trade uh, agreement between China and Africa. And we are also negotiating other FTAs to ensure that we Mauritius, we start behaving like, a, how would you call it, a, a connection a connecting link between those who want to invest and those who want investment. So this is the item two, is G to G. Mauritius, we are working with countries in Africa because we don't have the means of working with all the 54. So we have G to G agreements with Ghana, with Ivory Coast, with Senegal, with, and recently with Kenya. We are moving ahead on a G to G agreements where the, both governments commit themselves to working together on project development. I'll take the case of the, the G2G, the Joint Commission with Kenya, which was held uh, three weeks back. We are speaking of billions of dollars of investment in special economic zones. And what we are trying to do in Mauritius is to be the transmission belt between those who want to invest, investors, investment, finance, technology, channeled through the financial sector of Mauritius to the African countries. That's what we are doing when we, when we are, what we are trying to do in terms of trade. We are not showing the way. We are just trying to survive and to develop in an environment which is not easy. This is trade. The second aspect is maritime security because we speak of the ocean. Ocean means SDG, SDG 14. It means not only sustainable use of ocean resources. It also means protection of the marine ecosystem, which is our responsibility. Both go together. So what we have been doing is trying to contribute our own share to the whole thing. So in April this year, the Indian Ocean Commission with the Mauritian government and the Brussels and the EU organized in Mauritius a maritime security conference that groups some 250 major players, countries and organizations. We did it and we realized here also that when it comes to maritime security, there also we can't play the game of hide and seek. We realized how much when we come, let us say, to the sustainable use of ocean resources. And I don't want to name and shame here today, but there are countries who are voluntarily not seeing that their own fishing companies are destroying the ocean, IUU, illegal fishing. The Indian Ocean where we are today is being plundered by companies, fishing companies, 
not recognized officially by their countries, but tolerated by their countries. So some countries are helping in the destruction of ocean resources and staying put. And we have to speak it out. That when we speak of sustainable use of the ocean, we have also to flow with the idea that we are responsible vis-a-vis -vis the ocean in terms of preservation. Same thing when it comes to the preservation of the marine ecosystem. Easy to say, but climate change is there. And climate change, whether it be COP22, 23, 24, or the Green Fund, we are short of financial resources to ensure the survival of our ocean. Our ocean means, means it's a planetary gift that we've had from the Lord. So we have to protect it. And there again, what we are seeing is that in spite of what we are doing, pollution has reached levels never attained in this part of the world. We have to acknowledge it. Before cleaning, we have to acknowledge that there is dirt to be cleaned. And that's why when we speak of the marine ecosystem. Disaster management is something which is so crucial. That is our capacity to, to be prepared for preparedness when it comes to meeting with disasters. Let us say a spo um, petrol uh, spill in the ocean needs immediate action. So the whole idea of disaster management is being looked into into a very superficial way. I need to say it. Superficial because disaster management is something where we need action and quick action. And for quick action to take place, there need to be exchange of info. If, let us say, in the Indian Ocean close to Mozambique, there is a problem there, it can be anything, we need to be in a position to deal with it quickly, efficiently. And here what we are seeing, I have to share with you, is that the large countries are making wishful proposals and commitments. In exchange of info is being kept secret by most of the big countries. So how can you on one side, speaking of, of disaster management, and when it comes to exchange of info, some countries tell you, sorry, this is national security. So we need to know where we are standing when we speak of disaster management and of the need for action and the need also for exchange of info. Then my colleague, the minister from Sri Lanka, just spoke about it, drug trafficking. Drug trafficking in the Indian Ocean has reached level I've never seen before. I signed recently with the UNODC two agreements, one for AOC, one for Mauritius, to fight drug trafficking in the region. Drug trafficking and financial crimes work together. And I can tell you one thing, that we are very far from reaching a point where we can say that we have achieved control of drug trafficking in our ocean. We are very far from it. So coming to also piracy and terrorism, as chair of the Kanta Group, I can tell you one thing, that those countries and organizations which are working on board have spent billions of dollars. And I told them recently in Kenya, that it's good that we spend billions of dollars to stop the pirates and put them in prison. But that ultimately we have to realize that we, if we want to fight piracy, we have to fight the need to be pirate, which means therefore investment, development, employment creation, and getting people to not to become pirates. My message didn't go through. I must tell you one thing. As chair of the organization, I propose that part of those huge billions of dollars be used to allow Somalia and the neighboring countries to develop. We have to invest there. So this is just to tell you in a few words that we are, and believe me, I believe in what we are doing today. If not, I won't be here. I believe that Sagar, that Obor and the other initiatives make sense because we are moving from a global approach to development to, more, to a more regional approach to development. So I'm fully committed to it, but at the same time, it is my responsibility to share to you that the road ahead is challenging, but we can make it. But then we have to recognize that there are challenges which will have to be met in a courageous way. With those words, once again, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I wish once again to thank you all for having uh, borne with me 
all through. Thank you.